Well, we're going to talk about busyness today a little bit um, and busyness as a badge of honor. Um, and Socrates, Socrates said, beware of the barrenness of a busy life. And even back way back when they people talked about being busy. Um, so we kind of sometimes use busyness as a shield from others so that they can't ask you more uh, to do more for your others. Um, and sometimes it's a, it's because we feel like we have to give and give and give, and we feel uncomfortable asking and receiving. So then that busyness makes us feel good about ourselves. Um, and welcome, Pam. Um, did you feel ever like you're drowning in tasks? I've had it like, I consider like, sometimes I picture it like a leaf, a pile of leaves over top of me and I can't breathe. And sometimes you get so many tasks on your plate that you just don't know where to start. And I'm, you know, are you just feel like you're done with being, feeling like a failure and all that guilt, shame, and resentment that goes along with it? Let's see what we can do about that today. So the com, um, a productive person does things differently than a busy person. So like with a busy person, they um, don't prioritize prioritize well. A lot of times they'll take set tasks that are not as important, whereas a productive person chooses the top things on her list. Um, whereas a busy person will give their attention to anything, productive person will pay attention just to important things. And multitasking, we'll talk about that a little bit to later too. Um, busy people tend to um, multitask more and try to do more than one thing. And um, a productive person will focus on one task. And um, a busy person will do shallow tasks continuously, whereas productive people kind of batch the different tasks together so that you're in the same mode the whole time. Um, and then um, a busy person has lots of projects. And then a um, person that um, is a more productive will just have a few exceptional products. And then a busy person will say yes by default, whereas a um, productive person will say no by default. Um, and this is all based on our subconscious development. Um, our busy attitude kind of comes from what we're, we were early on um, in our lives, how our, um, we were brought up and programmed when we were young. A lot of the things that we have in our brains now and we're kind of programmed that way is from what happened before we were in seven or seven years old and under. Your brain waves are at the same frequency as if you were under hypnosis or under like a dream state of sleep. Um, and so they're uh, very highly suggestible. And also, um, they learn very quickly also, so that they can adapt and, uh, to the world, what, whatever world they're uh, born into. So there is quite a bit of difference between that subconscious, where all this stuff that the seven, uh, seven and under child brought in, they bring all that information in and it's stored in the subconscious. And um, the subconscious also does some uh, automatic things, um, like your heartbeat and how fast to breathe, and the responses to pain, like um, how you withdraw, you know, when things are hot, or like if you see a stick on the ground and you think it's a snake and you jump before you even you know, and then you realize, oh, it's just a stick. That's the, that's your subconscious in order in doing this thing. Um, and then the conscious part of your brain is the one that makes the decisions. Um, she, um, that continuous part of the brain where you um, are thinking and you're making decisions. But you know, the thing is that that conscious part of your brain is um, only 5% of the function of your brain. So let's, let's imagine this poor seven-year-old is like a, a clean computer, nothing on except that um, um, operating system. And you hook it up to the internet. It doesn't have any filters, no protection, no firewall. And it just takes all that information in. And that's what a child under seven does. It, it takes all the information into, um, into their adulthood. And all this data is heard, seen, and experienced is sort of stored in their subconscious. Um, but it's through a child's through point. And a lot of times we get things um, a little different when we're a child because we have a different viewpoint. Um, and it's not always accurate. And it's more in the egocentric, like they, everything surrounds them. Everything is caused by them. Um, like if somebody has an argument, they believe that, that they um, 
caused it somehow. And it, a lot of times it's not anything to do with them. So like I said before, our subconscious is 95% of our brain power. So 95% of our brain power is automatic, whereas there's only 5% that is the thinking part of our brain that actually can make decisions. And, and that's part of real power is your, is your thinking brain. Whereas the 95% is the part that's automatic and already um, uh, in present in your subconscious. And these are where a lot of these self-doubts and limiting beliefs and things that keep us back um, and keep us stressed out um, happen. It develops in our subconscious. So if your subconscious is not in sync with your, your conscious decision that you've made, um, like say you want to lose weight and you're, um, you've made this decision that I'm going to change what I um, want to eat. And that's in your conscious mind. Well, in your subconscious mind is your little child saying, no, I want to eat whatever I want to do and you can't tell me what to do. And guess who wins? <laughs> but there is a way to make that subconscious work for you and not against you. So I'm going to share with you three strategies um, to look at time differently. Um, the first thing we're going to start with is your inner game and how mindset and how, the, uh, how you think and how you feel and how you um, make these limiting beliefs in your, in your mind affect your inner game and how that will help your time management. And then also we're going to um, talk about how stress interferes with your time management. By getting overwhelmed and feeling um, these really strong feelings that make us not productive, um, and how to deal with stress in a different way so that you can make more time for yourself because you won't be overwhelmed. And then also develop a game plan that you can live with. My mouth is so dry. So basically your inner game is going to be like working on a positive mindset. And positive thinking actually decreases your stress levels. And it makes you uh, stronger against cancer and any other bug that is in the air. So if you, you know, are afraid of COVID or whatever, you need to think positive. And then also it helps us more, be more resilient when things pop up, because they always do, they always pop up. Um, if you kind of are more mindful of your surroundings and you stay in the present moment, you're not wasting as much uh, brain energy. Your brain takes like tons and tons of glucose to function and to think. So a lot of times what happens is that your brain, if you've done it more, one, more than one time, will make it automatic so it doesn't have to use as much energy. Well, that's the same thing with stress. If you don't have the stress, then you don't use up that all that mental energy and all that glucose. And um, it, you know, if you go low on your blood sugar, you know how you feel fuzzy and all that stuff, you can't concentrate. Same thing with this. By decreasing your stress, by thinking positive, um, you actually can be more, um, be more productive. So, um, and also a lot of times we get stuck in the past and ruminate on what is happening in the past, or we worry about the future and that totally takes our focus off the, this moment so that we have a uh, lack of focus on what we're doing right now because we're worrying about the past or the future. And having a growth mindset, I'm, I'm probably we've heard about this before, about the difference between a growth mindset and a fixed mindset. A growth mindset um, is where you feel like failure is okay, that it's kind of a learning opportunity, whereas a fixed mindset, failure is um, basically that uh, being a failure is like the worst thing ever, and they try not to do anything new because they're afraid they're going to be a failure. Well, with a growth mindset, you have a um, ability to go ahead and try new things without that fear of failure. And fear of criticism is not as much either because criticism is viewed as a help to uh, make yourself better and not as a, a slam on your um, self-esteem. And also your growth mindset is inspired by the success of others. Um, so you... Um, a lot of times with a fixed mindset, we'll feel like um, that somebody, you have that comparitis, you know, where you look at somebody else and they're not, you know, they have it all better than me. Well, that's kind of a fixed mindset, whereas a, a growth mindset is, um, is more inspired and um, causes you to want to do better. 
Um, and also the one thing in the brain that's really fascinating to me is the reticular activating system or the RAS. Now, when we were talking about how everything goes into the subconscious, the reticular activating system is your part that kind of sorts everything. And it helps you bring up the things that you need to focus on and kind of uh, helps you ignore the, all the other things. You get all this information all the time. And just think if you had all this noise, all these colors or whatever, how distracting that is. And that's kind of what people with ADHD feel like is they just get so much input and nothing is stored, is uh, separated out. You notice probably that if you get a new red car, you know, like we just recently got a red Outback and I see red Outbacks everywhere. <laughs> Every parking lot I go into, there's Outbacks that are red, and um, which is kind of hard to find your car then. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, so the thing is that um, the reticular activating system brings to focus the thing that's most important so that we focus on that. And um, to quote Henry Ford, he said, if you think you can do a thing or you think you can't do a thing, you're right. And when we think about how we're managing our time and busyness, this is one of the things that we have to keep in mind is that if we think we can't handle it, if we think we're overwhelmed, if we think um, there's no way I can do all this and everybody's asking too much of me, it, it comes true. So like I said before, this reticular activating system, we see these 400 billion bytes of information into our nervous system. And this is even when we're sleeping, we get all this information. Well, your reticular activating system actually um, will sort all this information and bring up the stuff that they think is important. Um, and depending on what your thought presses are on the um, regular, you know, how, how often you think positively versus negatively, that's what it brings up. Your brain, your subconscious loves repetition, loves to do things over and over, does not like change. So it, um, it wants to keep you safe. It's not trying to do something mean to you. It's just trying to keep you safe in the world, you know, so that you actually feel like you um, are safe. Like basically it's there because back when we had the dinosaurs and we were in the caves and we were fighting the dinosaurs trying to live, which is probably not true because the dinosaurs and people were in the same time zone or the time era, that's the word. Um, they weren't at the same time. But anyway, you had this, you know, ferocious lion coming after you or whatever, and your body goes into overdrive. So your body goes into this overdrive, this flight, fight, or flee. So all the blood goes to the essentials, which means it's not going into your brain. It's going into the arms, going to your legs, getting ready to fight or getting ready to flee or ready to freeze as kind of a protection sort of thing. You know, it's, um, let me see what's, yeah, yeah, that's, Marsha, that is where a lot of our habits come from is this whole um, thing with the, um, the subconscious, 95%, you know, it's kind of a difficult battle when you're doing it that way because you have all these, um, all these, uh, limiting beliefs in your head, 95% of your brain is saying, no, no, no. And just the, you know, that 5% is trying to change. <laughs> so it makes it a little more challenging. So to be fit, more efficient with the information, um, this reticular activating system will actually uh, close out a lot of things that we won't, we won't notice and it'll focus on the one thing. So the one thing that um, is really helpful when you're talking about time or anything else is that um, what we focus on grows. So if you focus on things being positive, that's gonna continue to grow. If you focus on, hey, I'm handling this just fine and I'm not overwhelmed, I'm, I feel like I'm handling things great, um, that's gonna continue to grow. Whereas you focus on, I'm overwhelmed, there's no way I can do this, I'm way too busy, everybody's asking way too much of me, that's what's gonna happen to you because you look for that proof in the world that's what your reticular activating system does. It looks for that proof. It looks for the pattern. It wants to know what the pattern is. And then it goes with that. It's kind of the way it learns to, you know, to change and to categorize things. So basically what this is all about is that I would like you to celebrate your wins every week. Write down what you get done every week. Don't focus on what's not done on your um, list, 
focus on what you do do. So every week, if you take that time, or even every day is actually better, at the end of the day, focus on what you won that day. What did you do? Um, and if you actually write it down, you'd be surprised at how much you really get done. Um, you, you didn't get everything off your list, but look at what you got done. Look at what you have completed. And by focusing on those wins, you're telling your brain, I'm winning, I'm doing great. And so the next day, it's easier and easier and easier to focus on what you're doing right. So that's one of the things that will really help with your time management. And also planning your rest breaks. Um, your brain needs a little time to rest in between and kind of um, for the reticular activating system to sort all that stuff. And if you can get a little bit of rest in between, um, like what I do, I like to do, I like to get up every 30 minutes anyway, because it's really good for your body. And I have some chronic pain issues. And if I don't get up, I'll, I won't be able to get up. So I do, I set the time of 30 minutes and then I get up and move around and that helps me. Well, it also helps my brain and my eyes. So I focus on something different. So my eyes feel better. And I, um, I use some different parts of my brain, you know, go do the dishes or whatever, just to do something different. And that just makes me more productive because I, you know, when you're tired and you don't get enough sleep, um, you don't, you're not productive. You can't be, your quality's, you know, affected. You can't do things as, as well. Your working relationships with other people or with your family, say your kids at home or your grandkids or whatever you have at home, um, what you're dealing with um, is, is challenged also by this. And that can really, really um, change how your time goes. If you're dealing with um, like a conflict, it takes the blood away from your brain because you go on that fight, freeze, um, or fight, flight, or freeze. And then your brain go, gets no, um, inf, you know, gets no blood, gets no sugar. And so you go fuzzy, you go fuzzy. And then, um, so you can't concentrate, you can't focus. So it makes it hard to really make the best of your day. Um, it also affects your ability to learn. If you don't get that sleep, it, it really affects your ability to learn and communicate with others. And, um, uh, and also the memory, it, actually learning and, and retaining information is really affected by your getting adequate sleep and your rest periods. But mostly you got to think about going to bed at a certain time and getting up at a certain time. And that routine actually helps your brain uh, function better because there are certain times of the night where you have, um, you know, the REM sleep that helps your brain work better. The other thing, I'm going to drink a minute, excuse me. Mm. The other thing that really helps with your time management is to have boundaries, especially for us overgivers. I don't know if you guys can relate to that because um, I, I've always struggled with this feeling like I had to give and give and give and not take or receive from other people. It was something I struggled with for a long time. Um, and it was something that I had to uh, work with a coach for a while and actually get on top of why I felt that way. Um, and it really helped me figure out, okay, where are my boundaries? Where, why do I feel like I have to give more than I can take? And, and you know, work through that. And it was very helpful. My, uh, my coach was awesome. And it's sometimes helpful to have somebody to talk things through because um, we don't always see things that the way somebody from the outside can see things clearer. Um, and also, um, you need to communicate these boundaries with others, with your family, friends, your coworkers, um, you know, your team. If you have a team, um, you have to be able to communicate um, what you expect. And um, that's something that I really help people with when I work with my clients is that um, practicing that and practicing powerful speech, powerful coming from a, a place of power instead of coming from a, a I'm, I'm afraid to tell them, you know, they're going to get mad at me or they're going to be upset with me, or I just can't say no to her because she, she'll get mad at me. You know, it's just, it's something that you need practice with. And it's like a, a any other muscle, the more you practice it, the easier it gets to hold those boundaries and, and save your time that way because we suck. It sucks a lot of time to be a, a if a, you're an overgiver because you um, put everybody first before yourself. 
Um, another thing that you can do to really save time is to take a pause before you decide um, what to do. Like with each task, you need to have a plan so that you pause first and you decide what is the purpose of this particular task that I'm doing. And then afterwards, after you get the task done, take a minute and look to see if you fulfilled your purpose. Like say you have a business and you have, you get on the phone with somebody and your purpose is to find out a per certain thing, like um, that to find out if they want to get together for um, uh, uh, an appointment or something. Um, so you have this purpose of getting an appointment set with this person. When you get on the phone and you do your thing, you get off and then you um, say, did I get that appointment set or did I not? And then if you need to tweak, then you can go ahead and tweak your uh, plan there. And also the big thing I wanna go on to today is dealing with stress, dealing with stress early and often. And the biggest thing to know is your triggers. Um, what actually causes you more stress? Um, you know, just being on under a lot of pressure. If you have a lot of things that coming at you from all directions, people here and people there, and you know a phone and a um, the dinging of your no notifications and all that stuff, you know it it can trigger a lot of um, stress. Um, and any big changes that come into your life, you know, I don't know about you, but I can deal with anything as long as I know what's coming. It's the thing about not having that control over what's coming. It just is kind of a more of a stressful thing. Um, and just worrying about and being anxious um, really is causing a lot of stress for people. Um, not having control over what's happening in a situation. Yeah, kind of talked about that one. And having responsibility that you're finding just overwhelming. It's kind of like out of your out of your comfort zone and you feel a little overwhelmed. Um, say you have like um, somebody staying with you and you're trying to do your business. They're like, kind of can get overwhelming sometimes. Um, and not having enough uh, different things to do. Um, you need to have a, a variety of things um, to uh, make your life a little bit more uh, balanced um, between work and fun. And anytime there's uncertainty, a lot of people cause stress, it causes them stress. So the first first aid one that I wanna go through, I'm gonna give you five exercises. And later on, um, uh, next week, next month actually, um, I'm gonna have a five day challenge coming up soon where you can actually make your own first aid kit that is very personal to you. Um, I give you some uh, a workbook and then you fill it out. And then if you have stress, you can just pull that out and oh, this is the one I need to do. And this is the words actually I need to use for myself. So that's a, a five day challenge that's coming up um, September 13 through 17. So that, um, be on the watch for that. <laughs> so um, this five, four, three, two exercise is really easy to do. And it's, um, it, you just, it's really easy to remember too. And if you mix it up a little bit, it's no big, no big deal. Um, but you just use all your senses and you go five things that you can see, four things can I touch, three things can I hear, two things can I smell, and one thing I can taste. Now, what this does is takes you out of the situation and takes your focus off what's stressing you out and brings it on this whatever, you know, these new things that you're seeing, touching, hearing, and smelling and tasting. So it, it kind of switches things up so it can uh, get you out of that overwhelm, stressed out feeling. Um, and another thing that you can do, just a minute, is um, just focus on something else for two to three minutes. Um, like uh, what I like to do when I get stressed out is I go fold towels or fold laundry. It's such a mindless thing for me. Um, and it's something that just kind of relaxes me. What I used to do, I'm a quilter, so I used to love to hand quilt because that was my uh, rest of my brain, and I just would get in this flow, and um, it would just be very calming. Um, I think my blood pressure would come down when I, whenever I hand quilted, um, and maybe just switch gears a little bit. Instead of doing something that takes a lot of focus, do something that doesn't take a lot of focus, or do something that takes a little different type of focus. Um, and light me up list. This is kind of my um, emergency list kind of thing. I have this list, and this is something I, I recommend you do, is put these things in a, on a list that you can get to if you start getting stressed out because your brain's not working when you're stressed out. 
You can't come up with ideas. You're not creative. You're not as uh, able to um, make decisions like that. So if you just take this list and you point to one and do that, it's just so much easier to get yourself out of this overwhelmed feeling. Um, I like to have at least 10 on my list and I add things to it all the time of uh, different things that I want to do. Um, and it's something to look forward to, to kind of too. And that breaks me out of that whole negativity. Uh, I like to include some creative activities like um, quilting or um, I make cards. I make um, homemade greeting cards and I love to do stamping and stuff like that and work with paper. Um, any physical activities, just getting outside. Um, one of the things that works for a lot of people is to take your shoes off and just, just stand in the grass and feel that earth underneath your feet. And for some reason that calms you right down. Um, I know that's something to do with the brain, but I'm not quite sure on how that works out. But um, apparently there is like this um, whole thing about um, connecting with the earth by touching the grass and touching the ground with your bare feet. Um, so just keep this list heavy. When you start feeling overwhelmed, this is something you can do um, to pick the, from the list so you don't have to think about it. Um, and if, this also works for um, if you're on a diet, if you're trying to um, not stress eat, or if you're trying not to emotionally eat, um, you have this list to go to if you start feeling that stress response where you want to eat. Um, this works for that too. Um, so why, why is it so important for us to manage stress? Um, stress affects our body, our mood, and our behavior. So there's a lot of different things we can look at right here. Um, like um, body can have headache, muscle tension. Like if you have already have chronic pain, it'll make it worse. Um, like even chest pain, people can have like a panic attack and they actually think that they're having a heart attack. Um, which you need to get treatment if you have chest pain and you um, and it's not going away. You have to go in for treatment. You don't want to ignore it thinking it's just stress because if it is something, you want to be treated right away. Uh, fatigue is really a big one because, like I said, you're taking all this mental energy, sucking up all your glucose out of your um, with your brain functioning all the time on overdrive um, so that you're tired. Um, a lot of times you aren't interested in having sex with your partner. Um, you can have stomach issues like irritable bowel or um, diarrhea, or it can even go you know, either way with that one. And sleep problems. A lot of people have a either have a hard time falling asleep or staying asleep or waking up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat. Um, so it also affects your mood. You can be more anxious. You can be uh, restless where you can't hold still, um, like you're wiggling your leg all the time, you know, just because you're, you're nervous and anxious. Um, it's hard to be focused when you're under a lot of stress. It's hard to um, be motivated to do something new and try something new. Um, it can make you kind of irritable. It kind of makes me into a grump. <laughs> And, or it makes me sad, one of those two. And like I said before, the stress eating is a big one. Um, a lot of people relieve their stress by eating um, and then become overweight. And that's even worse on your body. You can have angry outbursts. And this is what I call mean mom. <laughs> mean mom comes up and um, when you're getting overwhelmed and you feel stressed out and that mean mom kind of blasts at your kids, you know, or blasts at your grandkids and, or your husband or whatever. And you just feel awful afterwards. It's just like this big guilt. So if you manage your stress, a lot of these things can be under um, more of a control. Um, so social withdrawal is another one, drug and alcohol use, tobacco use, and you don't want to exercise because you're just feeling blah. Um, and this is my game plan that, uh, that I would like you to think about starting in your life. Um, a game plan that you can live with, something that makes sense to you. And sometimes you have to adapt this. And this is something that I help my clients with too, is like making that all fit together in their life so that they feel more, um, it, there's a sense of control. It helps them feel less stressed because they feel like they uh, know what's coming. <coughs> Excuse me. So it causes them less stress. So with a big picture plan, all you do is plan your week, your month, quarter, and year. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, when you're work planning this, it's important to get together 
uh, get the information from all the people that um, input to your your big picture. Like for me, like for us, we have to figure out from our kids when they need us for helping with the grandkids. <coughs> I need to know from my mom when are you going to the doctor, you know, so that I can plan that in my calendar and. Uh, my husband, what his work schedule is, you know, it's kind of like that thing, bringing all this stuff in to your big picture plan. Put all this information into, um, right, have it all collected. And then you want to put your good stuff first into your plan. And then um, also look at the longer term plans. Like if you're a businesswoman, you do a business at home, you ha usually have like a launch coming or a, a, a special activity or event. So if you look at it as a long-term thing, you can work on it gradually rather than all of a sudden look, next week's my event, ah! <laughs> so something like that. So I use tools and I recommend you use tools too to manage your time. Um, I like paper, I'm an old school girl, <laughs> but um, I also like my electronic calendar because it helps me with a, my Calendly link so that I can schedule um, and it keeps track of when I'm busy. And also if I have like classes I'm taking, it'll go right into my calendar. But I like to plan long-term plans on paper. For some reason, it's easier for me. Um, I use this, um, it's called a executive planner pad. And I really like it. Um, I just started using it and it's an organizer and it has like, um, pages where that you can um, write your to-do list and um, what you need to do in your calendar. It's really a very helpful thing. Um, so uh, for your long-term plans, you need to look at a calendar that's bigger. Like I've got a huge one, um, 36 by 48, that goes on my wall. And that's the first place I go, is I put the big things in there. Okay, I got a launch here. I've got a um, challenge here. Okay, what is going around it? I've got one to take care of the kids in, in um, Chicago, you know, coming up soon. Um, all that stuff goes on this big calendar. And then everything goes into my smaller candle calendar. And if I'm like in the middle of something, I'll just write, if I, something comes up, I'll write it on a sticky note. And I have a little basket I have um, from the dollar store. That works really well for me. Um, the thing that I like to do is to uh, put everything in buckets so that I can kind of, um, can, uh, it's a little bit more organized. So that I put things in like, um, I have a personal money, um, all different kind of um buckets that I put the different things and I'm taking a couple classes. So I put my work, uh, homework on there. Um, like um, if I have appointments, I put that on there. Um, if I need to do some research on some uh, particular tool, I have a tool one, um, that sort of thing. So um, like I said, with the buckets, you know, the personal one, you really need to have a personal one where you can put all your personal uh, plans and your to-do list. And then money one, you know, your bank trip, paying bills, invoicing, that sort of thing. And um, business one is more of a business development for me. Um, but you, um, you know, whatever's in your life, you can make that work. Errands, I love to do errands all in one list because then I can just go out one morning, get it all done rather than go out three mornings. <laughs> um, and coursework, like, like I said, I like to put my assignments in there so I remember to do them. Um, and so one of the other things that you can do to help you um, develop um, a different attitude toward time is to kind of find where your time wasters are. Um, I'm notorious from getting stuck into um, little kitty videos, you know, or <laughs> I, it's, it's, it's such a time waster. And so the one thing that I found that really helps me is I use that egg timer, but I set it for 30 minutes instead of 20 minutes. And when I get up, I record what I'm doing right before I get up at that 30 minute. And I've got myself quite a few times checking email or um, on Facebook or whatever when I was supposed to be doing some creative um, writing. And um, yeah, it's kind of, a, it kind of reminds you um, to get back on in focus. So this is kind of a good way to um, kind of test the theory. Um, blackout distractions. You, I'm sure you've heard of this one before. Turn off those sound notifications of email, texts. Um, and I like to let my husband know 
I, this is the time I need to work. Um, or if I need you time, um, I have set aside time in my calendar so that I get it done. Um, multitasking, I think we talked a little bit about that already. Um, there's finding out that it's really not uh, effective, that it's more like task switching, and it takes a while for your brain to switch, and you're wasting time by switching back and forth. It's better to bunch um, or batch a, a lot of things together that are the same. Um, it affects your ability to focus because um, even if you get in the habit of doing multitasking, um, it's hard for you to start focusing on one thing. And it's kind of like a, a muscle. You have to practice it and build up that whole ability to focus on one thing. Um, but if you get into that habit of multitasking, it's really hard to uh, stick with one thing and not, not multitask. Um, if you can avoid multitasking and just be in one task, it helps you get into that flow state. They always talk about um, where you can just keep on working and it, the time just goes by. And it, help, it doesn't help your um, creativity because you really need to be able to focus all your um, brain waves <laughs> in your creativity. And um, it, decreased, it increases your number of mistakes and your anxiety level and stress level. So um, one of the things that I like to do too that really helps is to have built-in routines in my daily schedule. One of the ones, I love the morning one where I have, um, I drink a 32 ounce glass of water and then, I, and then I do a little exercise and then I do a quiet time or I do a quiet time and then exercise and then I have breakfast and, um, and then go on with my day. And I usually try to do my, concentrated time in the morning because that's my best time but it's better to find out where what's your best time and to do creative things or more focused time during your best time if you're not a morning person doing it first thing in the morning is probably not the best time for you so figure out what works out in your schedule and oh, this is one that I have really worked hard on and I finally can do this is just check my email and batches um, and I don't check it all day long I check it once in the morning once in the afternoon and once before bed um, so that I can kind of um, not get stuck in it. Because if you do it first thing in the morning, like um, I don't do it first thing in the morning, I do it closer to 11 so I can get those hours in before 11 because somebody else finds a job for you. You know, you just get into somebody else's job instead of what you wanted to do that day. And I have to tell you this story. I love this lady. I don't know if you've heard of the fly lady. Has anybody heard of the fly lady? She's kind of a guru for um, cleaning and organizing. And um, she, she's really funny. Um, there's videos of her on uh, YouTube. And her thing is you start with a clean sink. Your whole house might be, your whole house might be a mess. But if you can have your sink in order, it helps your brain kind of accept that I can do this. And oh my goodness, it works. It really does work. Um, I, my kitchen sink is always clean. I always have it spotless and it's always shiny because it makes me feel good about the rest of the house, even if it is kind of a mess right now. Um, if I have that sink shiny and the bathroom shiny, I'm good. <laughs> so if you look her up sometimes, she's really funny. And she's got a lot of good ideas of how to organize and clean your house. So um, so putting these three strategies in will, will help you save time and open up more time for fun. And um, one of the things that um, I'd like to offer to you as people that are here is um, opportunity to um, work on your um, this uh, first aid first aid kit in the um, upcoming um, five day challenge that's coming up in September. So I'm gonna put the link in there for you to, um, if you would like to um, start, uh, go with that. Um, I won't do it right now. I'll do it a little bit later so that you'll get it. Um, and actually, you'll get it in the email. I'll send an email to everybody. Um, so, um, but that's coming up the 13th. And I hope you can come and it's going to be personalizing it. Um, one of the things, if anybody would like to, um, that I would love to do with you guys is um, uh, one of the things I like to do is tapping. I'm going to come out of here so I can actually see you guys. There we go. So um, one of the things I like to do with people is tapping. 
And um, that's one thing that's really helped me um, decrease my anxiety and, and stress level. So basically what you do is, um, uh, I think we're just going to do this exercise and then it'll be there for the people that are doing replay. If nobody wants to do it with me. Oh, okay. Thank you, Marsha. All righty. Um, uh, you'll be getting a replay. <laughs> All righty. See ya. Um, so um, the first thing that you do with tapping is you um, you want to ground your ground yourself. So you put your feet down flat on the ground so that you have your um, you have your feet flat on the ground and kind of feel yourself relax a little bit. And then take a deep breath uh, through your nose and then hold it for a count of seven and then out for eight. So you breathe in four, uh, hold it for seven and out for eight. So in. Hold it for seven, four, five, six, seven, and then out for eight. And then do that three times. And that kind of helps you relax and ground yourself. And then you want to, um, if you want to close your eyes or even leave them open, it doesn't matter. Um, just kind of uh, feel where you're feeling any tension in your body. Um, if you feel any discomfort in your arms or legs. Um, just try to concentrate on relaxing those. And just kind of notice if you feel anything anywhere. Start at your head and work down. Relax your, relax your forehead. Relax your eyebrow area. Relax your cheeks. Okay, now relax your jaw helps with relaxing your jaw is to think, um, put your tongue between the top of your mouth and the bottom of your mouth and hold it there. And it helps your whole jaw just relax. It's really good for people that have like TMJ or have um, any pain in their jaw to so just hold your tongue in the middle there and it just helps this whole part relax. Okay, now guts go down into our shoulders and your back of your neck. And if you need to move your head a little bit to get it relaxed, okay, then we're going to go down into our shoulders. And if you need to tighten them first and then relax, sometimes that helps you relax them a little bit. Okay, all the way down into your fingers. Feel it just relax. Feel the warmth. Now your upper back. Sit up straight. Good posture. Turn back, down through your waist, your lower back, your seat, and all the way down your legs. All right. Now that you're in this relaxed state, you're ready to do some tapping. Today we're going to do uh, tapping on um, feeling like you're enough, because a lot of times when you overgive, you're not feeling like you're enough. So this is one exercise that we will be doing today. Um, you start, the first part is this, you see where this is right here on your hand? You tap on that, that's the karate chop point, they call it. And then this is the setup part of your tapping um, where we actually talk about what's going on. It's more sentences. And when we go through tapping, tapping is um, on your meridian points. And then see right here, right in the eyebrow, and then the next one's right on the outside of your eyebrow and right under your mouth, eye, right in, see where that bone is there? That's under your eye. Under your nose, it's just right below your nose. Under your chin, it's right before, right underneath where your lips are. And then when I say clavicle, this is your collarbone. It's actually where, if you feel where your sternum bone is and where your collarbone meet, it's right at that point right on that bone. And then the next one is underneath your arm. You know where your bra strap comes down, um, the lower part of your bra strap? That's where you wanna tap underneath your arm. It's kind of hard to see on this. Um, and then on the top of your head. So it's outer inner eye, outer eye, under eye, nose, mouth, collarbone, under arm, head. Okay, all right, so go ahead and get started. 
um, first for the karate chip point, and I'll say it, and then you repeat it to yourself, either loud or quietly. Um, even though I don't believe I'm good enough, I choose to love and accept myself anyway. Even though I believe that I don't deserve to be loved, I choose to honor and respect these feelings. Even though my self-esteem is low and I don't know how to love myself right now, I choose to learn how to love and accept myself for who I am. Okay, top of the head. I'm not happy with the person I am right now. Eyebrow. I know that I'm different and sometimes I just don't fit in. Outer eye. I just like the way I look and how I stand out from everybody else. Under eye. I know that it's not okay to be different. Under nose. I know that society looks at me as being different. Under chin. This is what I've learned over the years. And I'm not sure how to love and accept myself. Collarbone. I have made so many mistakes and I have so many flaws. Under your arm. Others don't love me, so why should I love myself? Top of the head. I believe that I need the approval of others to truly love myself. Eyebrow. But I really want to learn how to love myself. Side of eye. Other people have flaws and make mistakes all the time but they still love themselves. Under eye. If they love themselves, so can I. Under nose. Other people have done wrongs to me. And I have forgiven them. Chin. If I can forgive others for doing wrong to me, why can't I forgive myself? Collarbone. How can I learn how to love myself? Under your arm. I need to love myself. Top of head. I deserve to be loved. Eyebrow. I don't know how to love myself, but I will learn. Outer eyebrow. I choose to learn to love myself. Under your eye, I am worthy of love. Under your eye, under your nose, I am enough. Under your lip, I am enough. Your collarbone. I know that I'm enough just the way I am. 
and I love and accept myself. Under your arm, I am lovable. Top of your head, I fully forgive and accept myself for who I am. Under your eye, I fully forgive and love myself. Under your nose, I am open to fully forgiving myself and loving myself. Under your lip, I love myself. On your collarbone, I'm overflowing for with love for myself and for others. Okay, just the top of your head now. Um, one of the things that you usually do before and after tapping is that you uh, read how much um, discomfort you have. Like when you were assessing your body, well, how much um, are you feeling whatever emotion, like enoughness at, at this point, um, how much enoughness that you um, are missing. So you grade it from one to 10, and then afterwards you grade yourself again and see whether um, it has come down. And if it hasn't come down as much as you'd like it to, you repeat the process. So that's kind of what um, is um, happening when you tap. Um, are you guys familiar with tapping? Okay. Well, um, thank you so much for being here. Hi, Linda. How are you?